Tim, you've been studying history a very long time. Yeah. Um, you started looking at patterns that seem to be re- repeating itself. What, what kinds? What what drew your attention? Mm-hmm. Well, one one big pattern is globalization and how at the beginning of globalization people are very optimistic and think, aha, things are all going to go the right way, there are no alternatives, we'll have liberalism, we'll have democracy, and then there are globalization shocks and suddenly we're all surprised and then democracy starts to roll back and liberalism doesn't seem so inevitable. That's happened once already at the beginning of the 20th century, it's happening again in the beginning of the 21st century, that's a pattern. And then there's a related human pattern, which is that People get used to things being a certain way. They forget that democracy is about the people, which means the individual people, which means individual responsibility. And then when things start to turn, they, they say, well, what can I do? Um, I'm surprised. This must be somebody else's job. This must be the job of the institutions. And once you go that far, once you say it's someone else's job, that the institutions will do it for you, then you're gonna lose your democracy. That's also a pattern. What are the warning signals now that we are losing democracy? I mean, I I don't like to think about warning signals because I think like life is one long warning signal. Like we're not really we're not really built for good systems or bad systems. What we are is capable of learning what is good and taking decisions about what is good. So I don't like the whole warning signals, red lines way of thinking about things okay. because I think life is just one big warning signal. We're also we're all heavily flawed, right? We have big problems and good politics is about recognizing that we all have big problems, including the people who want to rule us. They often have even bigger problems. And so democracy starts from the idea that the people are going to check each other with laws and with institutions, right? And so when you worry is when people stop caring about the laws and stop caring about the institutions. And above all, when people stop caring about or are even actively opposing the thing which underlies all the laws and the institutions, and that's the truth. Right. Um, You can't do without the truth. Once you start thinking, it's just your opinion, it's just my opinion, there are no facts, who knows? Once you start thinking that way, then laws and institutions become impossible because you can't have a courtroom without facts. You can't write laws without facts. You can't implement a policy without past facts. You can't even organize a citizen's protest without facts. So facts underlie everything. So um, the, the, thing which, you know, the thing which troubles me the most, and I think the fundamental really dividing line in politics now is between true and false, between people who care about the truth and between people who say, oh, who knows, there is no truth. And by the way, this is an interesting difference between now and the big totalitarianisms. The big totalitarianisms, the Nazis, the communists, they had their one truth. Right. Whereas our authoritarianisms, uh, at least many of them, they have zero. <laughs> they, have, they have none. If they win the game when they get everyone to stop believing that anything's true. And truth, lies, facts. You know, right now, they, they all seem to merge, right? People keep saying, you know, well, my truth is my truth. My facts are my facts. Why does it have to be yours? Mm -hmm. How do you see leaders using this now? Yeah, it's so important because facts are something that we get together. If I want to know how much pollution there is, I can't find out by myself. I need other people. If I want to know whether a school is a good school, I need to talk to other people. The people who produce facts are all working in communities, whether it's a scientist or whether it's a journalist. Facts come out of certain kinds of disciplined communal labor. If we're alienated, if we're all on our own, right. if all we do is look at our individual Google feeds or Facebook feeds, then we might think that we're getting to the truth, but we're not. What we're getting to is the stuff that makes us feel good and then it convinces us, and then we can get confused and we think, well, what makes us feel good is the truth. And then it's even harder for us to talk to other people because they're off in their own internet world with their own stuff that makes them feel good and suddenly there's a barrier between the two of us. Rulers exploit that um, directly by using the internet, right? Because they're in a much better position to use the internet than we are, but also they, they, they exploit it indirectly. Rulers who are very good at understanding emotions, like for example, Mr. Trump, and who don't care about the truth at all. Again, Mr. Trump is a good example are very good at taking advantage of this moment. 
It's this is it's like an ecosystem which is built for a creature like that. Well, one of the things that that Trump and Duterte have done is to actually attack truth tellers, right? Mm -hmm. So, how do people figure out who's going to lie when the very when the the most powerful voice in the land says you journalists are lying? Mm -hmm. And how how can we function in a in a? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for one thing, the people who are being attacked are the ones who are telling the truth. <laughs> Right, like the, the the tyrant doesn't attack the people who tell you what you want to hear. The tyrant doesn't attack the people who repeat his message. The tyrant attacks the people who are telling the truth, and so that's already a sign. Whether it's the Philippines or Russia or the U.S. or anywhere else, if the tyrant is calling people out by name, if the tyrant is getting people in prison, if the tyrant is having people killed. Um, if the tyrant is claiming these people are liars, well, that's a good sign that they are the ones who are seeking the truth. Uh, another thing which is really, really important is to just make a make a distinction between people like you and like a few thousand of you know your really admirable colleagues around the world. The people who actually travel places and talk to other people, the the, the reporters, make a distinction between them and everything else because there just there aren't that many reporters. There aren't that many human beings who are actually going out and looking for truth, and that's special. And uh, and I think also we just have to give it a moral valence. We have to say, people who are looking for the truth are courageous. They're doing something which is courageous. Um, they're they're not only they're taking risks, um, but they're also courageous in a different way, which is that the truth is never what you want it to be. It's never it's never comfortable, but it's the thing that we all need. Your book on tyranny compresses so much of your work. Right, the road to unfreedom gives it in a much longer mm. version. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's almost prescriptive in a way, right? So if you're talking to somebody in a in a democracy that's that's under attack, what are the key things you would want them to do? Yeah, well, you just use the word prescriptive. It's a very important word. I mean, democracy is something that you have to want. It's it's not like gravity. It's not just there whether we care about it or not. The, democracy is about the people ruling. The people have to want to rule, and so you have to ask yourself: Do I want to rule or? Do I not care? If you don't care, there will always be somebody who wants it more than you do and is willing to break the rules, and then you'll lose the system, and then your children won't have the freedoms that you took for granted. So it has to begin with a decision that you actually think some things are better than others, that democracy is better than other things, which I happen to think it is. Um, and then as far as what we can do, I think the very first thing um, after caring about truth, which we've talked about, is to try to do things a little bit differently than, than everyone else. It, the moment that you're guided by how everyone else is drifting is the moment that you're very vulnerable because authoritarianism is very good at creating drift. It's very good at creating the sense that this is normal and why should you stand out? You have to stand out, not much. I mean, some courageous people do stand out a lot, but you have to stand out a little tiny bit. You have to be a little bit unpredictable. You have to be able to say, eh, it's not just that I don't like this, it's that I think something entirely different. I'm going to act in an entirely different way. I'm, I'm not going to stand up when everybody else stands up or sit down when everybody else sits down. I'm not going to use the same words that everyone else has used. I'm not going to repeat the things that people said on the news this morning. I'm going to say something different. I'm going to be unpredictable. I think that's where it all begins, is, is, is the individual who, who, who thinks on her own about what's important and behaves in an unpredictable way. And then that means that you can bring other people along with you. Where do you draw courage in the, that kind of thing, especially when there are consequences? I guess, what was mm -hmm. it like in, in Nazi Germany? Or what, what can we take from that? How can we give our people courage? Yeah, I mean, the, I guess there's always an argument for acting now rather than later. Because if things are going to turn out fine, then acting now has no risks. If things are going to turn out badly, acting now has lower risks than acting later. So th there's, there's a really strong argument against putting things off, against manana when it comes to politics. And when you talk about courage, different people in different countries are in very different positions. Um, in some countries like my own, most people, if they're citizens, um, especially if they're white, are not taking very many risks at all at this point. And that's the luxurious position which you have to exploit. Like, so long as that's true, you've got to get out and march, you've got to write your letters to the editor, you've got to do the things that you can because it's going to get chipped away, 
right? If you say, well, now it's okay for me, maybe those immigrants are in trouble or those black people in trouble, but it's okay for me. If you say that, then inevitably you're, you're, you're gonna be unprepared when the time comes for, for, you. For, for you. But as far as courage for people who are really taking risks, I think that's more about how the rest of us have to admire them. I mean, I think it's very important that we don't see people like Trump, for example, as, 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 as exemplary. I think it's very important that we learn to value people and cherish people who actually care about values and, and take risks. I think it's very important that we think about heroes, not in terms of who the media or who the power gives us, but heroes as actually being the people who are individually courageous. I think it's hard to talk about courage because it's so unpredictable and you never know who's going to turn out to be courageous. I think it's what I, what I try to think about is is admiring the people who are courageous and giving them their names and giving them giving them credit. What this so technology has done a lot to enable this kind of rise of tyranny, mm -hmm. of fascism, right? Um, what does civic engagement look like in the age of social media? There's a I mean there's a little hygiene step which is if you're doing something on social media, it should be for the purpose of getting people to do something off social media, right? So I wouldn't be giving you this interview if the purpose weren't to get people to become more active in real life in politics. That's all, that's basically all I use social media for. Um, I mean, I have weak moments like everybody else, but the, the idea is if you use, if social media begets more social media, then we're gonna to move towards authoritarianism. If you can use it as an instrument to get people to vote, to get people to write, to get people to move their bodies out into the world, then it can be a good thing. But one has to be very, very, very careful, right? Before you go on social media, you have to think, what am I doing this for? And then when you're done with that, you have to get out. Because if you don't have a purpose going into it, you'll just get drawn in and you'll never come out. The behavioral modification system. Um, this happened so fast, right? It mm -hmm. seemed like democracy was okay, and then within a short period of time, and you outlined the 20 steps that people shouldn't be doing in, on tyranny, but ha I guess, there, there you go. It happened so fast. Mm -hmm. What will prevent it from, from accelerating? That is a great question. I mean, the, un the, the underlying things, I think, are the underlying problems are globalization shocks, inequality and I mean economic inequality social inequality and um, and then this problem with the internet and truth which we just weren't we weren't that happened really fast between about 2008 and and let's say 2008 2016 people just weren't ready for it and still very few people have really understood what's happened to our brains and what is happening to our brains so to reverse those things First of all, we have to have awareness, right? I mean, humans have to have conversations where we say, hey, these things are going on, right? I mean, even inequality is not really broadly understood. Just how many Americans, for example, are not paying just how much tax, um, that's just not really well understood. That the big, like that Amazon didn't pay any taxes last year at all, right? Which is an extraordinary fact. Like these are things that have to be known and then have to be changed. Uh, our individual attitude towards the internet, but then also the way the internet is run and the way it's regulated, that it's not given a free pass. I mean, books don't get a free pass. There are rules, there's copyright, you know, there have, there have to be rules. And also thinking creatively about how we can use um, taxation of the big internet companies to fund local journalism. I think that, that would be a really good thing. And, uh, and, and then we, we, have to, we have to think about the state, I think for me, the state again, as a way to create normal lives for people. So without big ideologies, I mean, I agree that those are done for, but the idea that um, the state is there so that we can have education, we can have healthcare, we can have pensions, so that life, which is hard enough already, doesn't have the stress of the beginning of life, sickness, end of life, that some of that stress can be taken away. And then, then we're freer, then we can make up our minds about what kind of people we wanna be. Those are basics, those are like the big underlying things, but the things that we've been talking about in the short term are really important, that people have to you know, wake up, look yeah. around, make their own decisions, yeah. um, care about what's true and support other people who are, who are looking for what's true. In the age of chaos though, and abundance of information, how do people figure out what to believe? I, that, that, see, I think that's really easy. I mean, I think that's much, I think that's easy, but it's like, it's like you're in a buffet and all there is is candy 
and like cake and cookies and you say well well how can i find where can i find my vegetables where are my carrots and the answer is like you're in the wrong restaurant right like it the answer is not that hard. The answer is you, you, you trust the investigative journalists and you figure out where they are writing. So you don't start by opening a screen and seeing where that's gonna lead you. Like that's going to the wrong restaurant. You start by saying, oh, who are five or 10 investigative journalists in my country who I know travel and talk to people and do hard work? And then I'm gonna follow them, whether they're writing for the New York Times or whether they're writing for BuzzFeed or whether they're writing for the Washington Post or you know, whether they're writing for Novaya Gazeta, whether they're writing for Ukrainska Pravda, whoever they're writing for, I'm gonna follow those people um, and then I'm gonna read what they write. Do that first and then if you've got time for other things, do those other things. That's, that's the trick. I mean, I'm a person, I'm gonna pay attention to other people who I know are doing the work rather than saying, oh, I'm just gonna kind of drive down the street and there's a restaurant, oh, I'll just go to that restaurant, right? And that's not a generational thing. I mean, um, just like mm-hmm. kids are like getting all their stuff from TikTok or from, I guess, I love that because I'm a journalist. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, journalism, news groups are under attack now. Our business model is dead and the very same platforms that are attacking us on the revenue model are also attacking our credibility and eroding that trust. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's so few people like you. Only one person wrote the books you wrote, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? What do you do for people who are so easily distracted well we are this, this is where it all, this is where it started I mean we're, we're imperfect we're imperfect which is great if we, if we were perfect we wouldn't need politics we're imperfect we're easily distracted and that's why you know that's why you have education and that's also why you can't hand off education to the platforms yes. why you can't digitalize education because if you digitalize education you create a situation where the kids know more than the teachers and the kids know all the end, all the escapes and all the ends around and 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 the kids um, the kids end up thinking that life is just a place where you escape from life. Oh you know? my gosh. So, um, so, you, so yeah, we're easily distracted, but that's why you have to have schools, and that's why the schools, I think, have to be about pens and paper and very traditional methods and teachers talking to children and as much human contact as, as possible. And, I mean, the kids, what I, so I teach kids, right? I've been doing it for 20 years. I have kids, and my experience with, with um, the, the, the gadgets has been that, yeah, they're addicted to them, but on the other hand, if you take them away by force, they actually enjoy it. So, I mean, I, I banned gadgets in my classroom in 2006, and, and I teach very big classes where the students do very well, largely as a result of that. They like the feeling that they're together in a classroom as people, and they also learn better. I mean, this, the research is all on my side here too, but it's just my experience. They simply learn much better if they're not distracted by their own screen and the person next to them screen and all the noise of people going, going like this. So yes, everyone's distracted, but I wouldn't, I, I, would, I wouldn't give up on young people at all. I would say like, you just, there just have to be some sensible rules. Like, sure, you can do that when I'm not around, but in the class, we're gonna pay attention and we're gonna be human beings. I'm keeping track of time. Two last questions. Okay. The first one was, uh, when was the point and what alarmed you? Like, when was the point of alarm for you that something had changed and you had to write something? Yeah, I mean, we all try to like, be internationalists and follow the whole world and you know, you do a great job. But I, I work on Eastern Europe yeah. and so, for me, the moment where it was clear that something had changed fundamentally was late, <clears throat> late 2013, when there were protests in Ukraine, because Ukraine was about to sign an important agreement with the European Union, and most of the population was in favor of it, and the president, under Russian pressure, changed at the last moment. And then there was this weird barrage of Russian propaganda, which had like seemingly unrelated themes like homosexuality and fascism, and it was unclear what that had to do with anything. And, and I was asked to go on American TV and talk about this a little bit. And then I, I was living in Europe at the time and I realized, wow, it's the Russian th- memes that are doing the work, even though the protest is a very simple story. People want to be closer to the European Union. They want to be able to travel. They want to have jobs. They want law. They want normal lives. It's really not very complicated. And yet we're talking about this stuff, which is unreal. And, that's, and, and that got worse um, after Russia invaded. Right. And I realized, hmm, we seem to have flipped where it's not reality driving the internet, it's clearly the internet driving reality at this point. And then there are certain people who are driving the internet in very clever ways and there are certain tricks that they're using. 
So I noticed that in 2014, I started writing about it, and that's what led to the road to unfreedom and also to on tyranny. But, um, and then, it, of course, the same thing happens in other places. Uh, it, it, it happens in the European Union, it happens in the presidential elections in the US in 2016. So that was, that was the moment, 2013, when a light bulb sort of popped over my head and I realized that we're dealing with, you know, some old things in some new packages. Um, if I keep thinking sometimes 2020 is the year that will mm. determine whether globally we can act in a way to prevent decades of fascism, of mm -hmm. tyranny, mm -hmm. um, how do you see this moving forward? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? I think I, I agree with you. I mean, I, and, and of course, the picture is not all bad. You know, there are like. In Slovakia, there's a very good president, and the parliamentary elections just went in a very interesting anti-oligarchical, anti-corruption way. There are there are bright spots here and there. There, as you know very well, there are good people. I mean, and and even the places that look bad right now, it's often like a 54-46 divide or a 52-48 divide, and things could things could also go back the other way. The way I see it is that democracy is going to come back when people are able to make truth cool as opposed to cynicism cool and i think truth should be cool because like cynicism was cool when i was a kid which means that cynicism has been cool for a long time which means that it really should go out of fashion at some point right like it kind of hurt, breaks my heart when i see like teenagers thinking that being cynical is cool and i think like you realize that like everybody was doing that in the 80s you know, like, can't you come up with something else? Anyway, I think democracy comes back when facts and investigation and journalists become cool. And I think democracy comes back when the people who care about it do a better job of articulating the future. So we're talking about how things are going wrong, and that's fine, and that's important. But we also have to be able to say, like the Democrats in the U.S. right now, for example, have to be able to say, look, things could be a lot better, I mean, not just normal, you know, but a lot better than they are right now. It's not just that we can stop climate change, it's that we can make an economy which is better based on different kinds of energy, right? It's not just that we can stop people from being sick and dying, we can remove a lot of the stress of daily life with better healthcare, right? That things just could be a lot better than they are now. Because what the, what the authoritarians now have done is they've taken away the truth, and they've, but they've also taken away the future. That's the thing. And if you want to, and democracy has to have the future. It's all about how we can make decisions now and then things will be a little bit better. Fantastic. Thank okay. you. Thank My you. My pleasure.